The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, um, um, my name is Chris Reed. I'm the, the founder and chief exec of Connect Childcare. Uh, apologies for having to reschedule uh, the, the webinar from yesterday. Uh, we had an unprecedented surge in uh, last minute attendees, which ultimately broke our license for the webinar software. But um, uh, we're, we're here now, which is the main thing. Thanks very much for taking the time to, to join the latest in our series of Connecting Childcare webinars today where we try and address some of the challenges faced by the UK childcare sector in this difficult time. Um, it's hard to imagine how the world has changed over the last two months since the government introduced the current lockdown measures. And the announcement last week that nurseries can open the doors again from the 1st of June has brought an understandable level of uncertainty and confusion to providers across the UK, particularly to those that have been closed since the lockdown began. Um, that's actually supported by the output of a recent survey that we ran across our 3,000 or so customer base that suggested that out of a total of 800 respondents, only 13% felt confident that they could safely open their setting to all on the 1st of June. Um, so with that in mind, uh, we wanted to arrange today's webinar to try and address some of those concerns and explore the, the practicalities and challenges associated with reopening and to build on uh, some of the many positive experiences uh, of the nurseries that have remained open to support key workers throughout this uh, throughout this period. Um, and the latest CEDA figures uh, that have been published in the last hour or so suggest that there's about 37% of nurseries uh, remain, and nurseries and preschools remained open uh, throughout the lockdown period and about 52% of childminders. Um, so obviously there's a lot to, lot to build on there. Um, the session should last around 45 minutes to one hour uh, and there'll be an opportunity for you to ask questions to the panel towards the end of the webinar. Uh, I hope you enjoyed today's sessions uh, and it would be great if you could complete the, the short survey at the end of the webinar to tell us how we did and what you'd like to see next. So uh, without further ado, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome our esteemed panel to the session today. Um, we're having a few technical difficulties um, with Juno Sullivan connecting into the webinar at the moment. We're doing everything we can uh, to, to, to get her on board, but uh, we thought we'd just continue anyway until, until we managed to, to resolve that. So um, in no order of priority, uh, Carrie Rankin, uh, if you give us a wave, Carrie. Um, Carrie's the, the CEO of Bert Bertram's Nursery Group, um, operating 42 nurseries throughout England and Scotland. I think that's uh, roughly 13 in England and 29 in Scotland. So uh, welcome, Carrie. It'd be great to get your views on uh, the latest announcements from uh, Nicola Sturgeon yesterday in, in relation to the Scottish uh, lockdown uh, uh, roadmap. Um, Linda Baston Pitt uh, has spent many years running her own successful nursery, uh, the old schoolhouse down in Suffolk, uh, which became the first nursery in the UK to win the prestigious Investors in People Award. Um, and that's a platinum award, actually, to be fair, back in 2016. Uh, and Linda's now the CEO of Purple Bee Learning uh, and the co-founder of the Panko Qualification. Hello, Linda. Um, hi there. And la hi. Uh, and last but certainly not least, uh, David Wright is the owner of Paint Pots, a nine setting group down in Southampton. Uh, and David's a well-known figure uh, within the sector uh, for his tireless work in promoting the role of, of men in childcare. So welcome to everyone. We really hope that, that June can, um, can, can access the, the webinar, uh, but thanks to everyone for, for uh, rearranging at last minute and making this happen for us. So uh, there's quite a lot to get through today. So, so let's dive in. Um, the first question, and, and really I think in terms of the format for today, obviously we all know each other, we're all friends, so it'd be great to have it as conversational as possible. Um, and the, the first question really is a, is a question for everybody. Um, but I'll, I'll start just by, um, by asking, asking Carrie in the first instance and then move around. But So Carrie, how has the, the lockdown been for, for Bertram Nursery Group, um, particularly you know, as, you, as you straddled to uh, two countries essentially in England and, and Scotland? And what do you think the biggest challenges are facing nurseries uh, when trying to get back to some form of normality? Um, yes, well, first of all, can I just say thanks for the invite. Um, really nice to be on a panel with such experience. So uh, nice to think that I'm up there with um, Linda, David in there in June. So, and yourself, so I really do appreciate the time to talk to everybody. Um, I, I have to say that um, the, the, the process for um, us closing down nurseries initially we thought was um, 
quite difficult to deal with. It was very emotional um, when the panic, uh, when the sort of COVID-19 um, kind of lockdown was announced. Um, and, and we probably amongst everybody else were, were, were struggling to come to terms with um, what that actually meant, the, the children going back away to their families, practitioners not seeing their, their children. Um, and that was quite difficult. And I, and I think then all of our practitioners went off on furlough, which again was, was quite difficult to, to see and think that a lot of our teams were going to be back in their own houses and not, not in work. Um, we, we tried to understand the demand across the, the, the portfolio um, and, and at which sites we would keep over. We slowly phased the closure of our, of our sites down from the 23rd onward. Um, we, we, we opened every site, I think, on the 23rd and then gradually over that week, we, we shut them down 50% of the time. The demand from our parents just wasn't there. And even where there was demand, we we're finding people were telling us they were going to come in, but not actually turning up. So. Um, we ended up with uh, five sites in England and five sites in Scotland a week and a half down the line um, and that reduced down to two sites that were hubs in Scotland and three sites that are, continue to trade as hubs in England. Um, that's been a huge learning process for everybody involved um, in operating the settings but I have to say um, the, the commitment of the teams has been absolutely fantastic and they have put themselves out there um, to, to continue to deliver care to the children and to the families without question. Um, and I'm not going to say it's been a surprise because they're all great, great um, team members, but we were blown away simply by the number of people that wanted to stay and look after the children. Um, and the families that wanted to continue using the service were really happy to see the same faces on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, it, it's been, it's been okay from that perspective managing the settings um, the difficulties have been trying to do that in and around the um, the demands of the parents and the changing needs and flexibility of the parents so understanding at what case we would need to ask people to come back to work or put them onto furlough so all, all we've done pretty much is just reduce the numbers over time but I think over the last two to three weeks it's been very steady state the numbers that we've had in our settings have been pretty consistent. Um, the majority of people obviously being on furlough, we've tried to keep contact with, with our staff teams um, through doing weekly um, quizzes and you know general conversations. Uh, everyone's probably zoomed out on family quizzes and everything else, but we've seen a good lot of interaction from our teams on, on those types of um, uh, events. Um, and we've also asked them above and beyond the furlough um, restrictions from a safeguarding perspective just to put their own nursery hats on and keep in contact with families as much as they can do uh, and those children and staff members who they feel might need contact uh, over the period of furlough. Uh, and obviously now we're moving into a, an opening phase which is a completely different discussion uh, um, which I'm happy to move into at the, at the right point. But it's, it, it's been a, a massive learning curve, I'm sure, for everybody else. And for some people who've, been, who've had their full nurseries closed, and perhaps many people are on this webinar today, actually they're coming back into, into a very different life and a very different um, potential operation. And there's an awful lot to take on board. There's a huge amount of um, a change and difference in operational practices that, we, that everyone's got to consider. And I think the close down in that respect was easy in comparison to what's going to be the opening process. Absolutely, and, and is that David? Is that consistent with the, you know, what, what you faced since lockdown began, and um, you know, what what was your experience like? Yeah, it's very similar to Carrie's, I think. Um, I think we're all now familiar with that term, Corona coaster, and <laughs> uh, that's a very graphic description of uh, how that's affected us emotionally. Um, how that's affected us in terms of planning and responding to, you know, the uncertainty and the the lack of information. I think it's been challenging as an organisation because we are focused on people, both adults and children, um, to meet their needs. And as Carrie said, to respond to um, how those are changing over time. And, you know, it is about emotions. It is going to be about emotional well-being, and I'm sure Linda will refer to that as well. 
particularly as we come back. And I, I've seen some quite worrying um, plans for some areas where people are stripping everything back and almost imprisoning children. And, and my concern is that, uh, you know, we're going to be looking at children thinking they're somehow being penalised for, for being who they are. And, you know, we can't do that. So our, our experience has been very much, let's try and keep things as normal as possible. Let's have safe and secure environments that are full of laughter, where there are, you know, loving adults who are willing to cuddle children. But at the same time, we've got this overarching um, duty of care, both to our teams um, and to our children. And, and we're doing that with minimal um, support from government, really, I think. You know, we've, we've had mixed um, information and that might be because that's not there. And, with, you know, in England, we're still waiting for that um, detailed guidance to be produced for us to reopen again. So it, it's, it's really been um, an opportunity to use our networks in that respect and to, to work on best practice but I am reassured by the experience we've had to date. You know, we have opened nurseries, we have had children, they have felt secure, and we haven't had any incidents in, in our experience. And, and, you know, looking to other providers, that seems to be generally the case. And I, and I hope that gives people reassurance moving forward. Absolutely, I think that was. Um, I think that's probably echoed by the the survey that was run by the COVID nineteen response group, which I think, um, you know, quite a lot of the people on the uh, on the panel will be involved in. And I think was it uh, over three hundred and three thousand three hundred thirty nine children that have been cared for each day. There were only three confirmed cases of COVID nineteen in children. I think there were two confirmed cases in adults, and none of those have been tra traced to transmission in the nursery either. So. You know, I think it does put a bit more perspective on um, on exactly what you what you what you both referenced then. Um, Linda, just just moving on to you for a moment. Did, how have you found the, the the lockdown measures and you know life since the uh, since the twenty third of March? I mean, building on what Carrie and Davis had said, I mean, at this early stage of what's going to be a long term challenge, I think what's becoming clear, as you've just touched on, David, is the massive strain it's having on the emotional health of children, families, and uh, the staff team. And a lot of practitioners I've been talking to have been supporting parents virtually, um, at, but to the point where they're really struggling. And we know, as you were saying, David, that we have to act on, on credible scientific evidence. It's essential, but science, and I think that's come up in some of the tweets, hasn't got all of the answers. And I think it's coming from the two different um, areas of research in science, because on the one hand, as we're saying, you know, we have to be supportive and build supportive relationships, but at the same time, we have to socially distance. And I think yeah. the biggest challenge is going to be reconciling those two areas. And I think one of the things that we can't have is the trade-off between safety and well-being. Well-being has to be paramount and first and foremost. And I think some of the the messages that are coming through, and one I think um, David was involved in, there was a kind of a blanket um, ban, in, I can't remember where it came from, about children being in comforters into nursery. And you think, well, and that without a doubt, it's gonna be hard enough with motion new children coming in, but once you start saying no comforters, you know, how, how do you manage that? Is it something that we can do in nursery? You've got a washing machine, you wash it, you take it back home again. And can we, find ways to navigate through to make sure that well-being is the number one priority dispelling some of the myths which that used to happen years ago with Ofsted you know so this is where the, the conversations we're having now are so crucial mm -hmm. to make sure we are doing the right thing that it's in some cases will be trial and error but for me well-being without a shadow of a doubt is key absolutely I'll, I'll come back on to the the well-being in particular the, the well-being um you know the, the emotion and well-being the staff uh, being vital i'll come on to that uh, in a moment david if i could just step back to to you um and just just touching on uh, linda's point there about social distancing and obviously you know um you know that some of the some of the blanket bands as you referenced with regards to comforters and you know and, and actually there's some of the challenges um around 
you know, putting social distancing measures in place for children in their early years. Um, how, how have you, when you, when you were open um, with the, uh, the smaller number of settings, how did you implement social distancing within the nursery and, and what measures are you going to be putting in place to make sure the sites that the, you know, the sites that you continue to reopen are, are safe for colleagues, children and, and the parents as well? Well, firstly, can I just say that I'm not a great fan of the term social distancing. We had a little conversation about that mm -hmm. earlier. You know, we, all, we are all social beings and we have a need to be connected to one another. And that yeah. comes back to this, you know, the whole area of well-being. Physical distancing in terms of keep, keeping people safe and breaking transmission is something different to that, I would suggest. And, um, you know, it, it, it's about proportionality and it's about what's appropriate and what's practical in the settings that we have. So context is everything in this, to my mind. You can't have a one size fits all plan. And what we're saying to our managers is we're not going to use the term bubbles, but we are calling them friendship groups. And that yes. will do be determined by the building that you're in so if you've got small discrete rooms that you can physically allocate children into that makes life easier for you if you're operating for example in one larger space that you then have to logically break up or physically um, separate children then you've you know got more of a challenge on your hands and i think the other thing to say is we are dealing with human beings here we are dealing with children, some of whom don't have the behavioural capabilities to keep themselves in one space, either because of their age or of their development stage. And it's unreasonable to expect them to be compliant. You know, that is not something that we're here to enforce in children in any way. So we can't have one adult with eight children constantly supervising them to make sure they don't run across to see their friend on the other side who they're no, now not allowed to see. So I think the practical approach that I'm considering is we have a designated friendship group with a number of children there. Um, but there will be times when those children interact. Now the science, as far as I understand it tells us that a small interaction for a short period of time is not a huge risk somebody that's closeted in a small room uh, with poor ventilation for upwards of 15 minutes presents a different risk a, a, a higher level of risk so we want our staff to be comfortable we want our children to be comfortable in doing that and logically we will group children and try and keep them apart but they will interact during the day and it's minimizing that it's reducing the risk it as i went said at the start it's not eliminating it we can't do that and we can't do that in the spaces we've got now the extent to which we uh, mitigate some of those challenges is, is going to be determined by the overall number of children and so i'm saying to my teams you need to look at your setting and decide what you feel you're confident in um, keeping safe within that and that may be 50 percent of what you would have had previously um, but we're starting you know from where we are we're confident with what we've done over the last eight weeks we're going to scale that up see how that feels and then see where we move from there um, you, we're going to be with this for a long time and it has to be workable so it can't be something that heightens everybody's fears and anxieties it needs to be somewhere where children can come in and feel comfortable and staff feel comfortable organizing that and i think that kind of family grouping feel to me sounds more comfortable than i'm putting you in your block and thou shalt never move out of it and you know the other practical aspects are somebody's got to go to the loo at some point during the day somebody's got to eat lunch and how do we how do we manage that so we will be looking at things like arrangements for lunch hours um, we'll be looking at um, which children come on which days in terms of those groups because you know again i can't have a member of staff there from seven o'clock on a monday morning consistently through till six o'clock on a friday evening not having eaten slept or had a wee <laughs> so you know let, let's do what's practical and, and what's reasonable absolutely and, and just turning to you carrie just for just for a moment is that 
is that a consistent approach that you're taking at Bertram's, at Bertram Nutrition Nursery Group, rather? Yeah, um, I have to kind of agree with with David on an awful lot of this. That um, we we have taken a lot of time to discuss this, and we've boiled this down to risk assessing. And um, this is about the decision that you're making um, in your group, in your business, with your teams. Um, we need to be really careful, you know, and, and just for clarity here, this is our opinion, these are our opinions, it's potentially our preference, it doesn't supersede any kind of guidance that's out there um, from the government, um, and what we should be doing is all risk assessing, and whether we include in that, you know, what, what is the, the, the competency of our team, what's the space that we operate in, what's the size of the room that we're operating in, what training are we providing, what equipment do you have? What outdoor space do you have? All of these things will play into the decisions that you're taking around those cohorts, those bubbles, those groups, whatever you decide to call them. Um, we've we've made the decision to call it a safer play group. Um, you know, to remove the word bubbles. It's again, it's about it's about your own decision, your interpretation. And I think that there is a real risk in all of this that we try and plan for everything. And that trying to plan for everything means that we'll get more things wrong. Mm. Um, it's, it's actually more about saying, look, we've considered this, we've used the guidance, we've risk assessed, we've talked it through with our teams. Do the stuff that you would normally do. You know, if you come across a challenge, how do we best manage this? Um, you know, I, I think we can really get bogged down, and especially if you as a, as a manager have been away on furlough um, for a long period of time. We've had the benefit of talking about this for the best part of two months. And, you know, there's been lots and lots of groups out there talking about what's the right way to do it, going backwards and forwards with, with government and the DfE, lobbying discussions. Um, coming back to this, whether it be you've kept up to speed with things as best you could do, but actually some of this for, for, for many of you will be brand new. And there's a real risk that you... Um, you're going to meltdown trying to plan for every single thing and that's a real danger take some sensible decisions and then review them in the first week of operation in the first few days of operation you might turn it on its head and say it's not working for us I need to do something different we need to change what we've what we've thought would work into something different and talk about that with your parents be clear with your parents that this is new to everybody this, we haven't nobody's experienced this before if you go to them and say we've got a policy that covers this we've planned for everything we're not going to make a mistake that's where you'll get it wrong and you've got to go out there and say we will get things wrong we will make mistakes work with us and um, be patient with us um, but what we'll do is we'll be um, transparent with you we'll tell you where we think we're going to make, have to make changes to the, to the processes we originally planned set some principles is probably what i would say you know, some guiding principles, whether that be your safer operating procedures, and say, these are the principles using the guidance that we're going to try and run by. And if we make the changes, we make the change, changes for the right reasons with your input and with our staff's input. I think that's really important. I know we were, we were talking yesterday, and I, and I think you referenced a framework that you've tried to bring in, which was it the three E's? And that, that, that was in a similar kind of, you know, trying to put some structure around how to make decisions. Um, yeah, I'll tell you where that came from, Chris, and, and it's a really horrible thing to have to talk about, but it's the reality of being a, a director of a business and having accountability. You know, we all we all come in every single day and shut the doors, you know, saying that we want every child to have gone home safe um, uh, and all our members, uh, all our staff members and our employees to have um, worked safely in the nursery. It's a very different environment we're in now. So some of the, the concerns that we've had is about liability as a director. You know, actually, if things go wrong, there's a you know, we're unfortunate in that claim culture environment anyway, aren't we, which drives everybody mad. But, you know, we, we are going to have to make sure that our teams fully understand what they're doing and why they're doing it. Um, and that we can evidence an awful lot more because if the worst happens, um, people have been talking about if there is a traceable incident of COVID-19 and at worst of death, how do you protect yourself, protect your business? Um, and, and like it or lump it, it's a conversation we have to have 
So we've kind of um, started to look at um, using the three E's. So we, we have in our business safety everyone, everywhere, anyway, which is C, and we use the acronym C. Um, and we've just expanded that to three E's, um, which is explain, exhibit, and evidence. So we want all of our teams to be able to explain why we're asking them to do what we're doing, not just follow a procedure without any understanding of why behind the scenes. Exhibit it, so can you show me, can you actually put that into practice, you show me what that means please? Because they might have misinterpreted it and then we need to make sure that they, they understand and they, they're doing it properly. And then evidence, so where there's a need for evidence, signing things off, you know, whether it be, you know, our um, sanit you know, sanitization stations, whether you're recording the cleaning stations, that I have sanitized my uh, the toys that the children have been playing with every half hour, hour, or however you choose to do it. So it's just trying to get something that we can um, relate to in the business. I'm not saying that's the right thing. Um, I've heard other people do fantastic things with their seven golden rules. It's like anything, isn't it? It's just trying to create that repetition where it becomes ingrained within the business, within the DNA, because of how important yeah. it is. And it's digestible as well, isn't it? Is you know any member of staff you know instantly knows what they're what they're supposed to be focused on which is which is going to be really important um yeah. just just sticking with you carrie just just for a, just for a moment um and if i sort of come back to some some of the um the output from the survey that we ran um we we asked questions around how confident you know our, our customers were um around bringing back staff from furlough and i know you touched on this right at the outset but how are you managing staff coming back from furlough, what challenges do you anticipate? And obviously I think somebody, I think Linda may have mentioned it as well. Some of the, some of the staff members are going to be out of the business for two to three months. How, how do you manage that sort of reintroduction into the nurseries? Um, the simple answer is there's no easy way. Um, it, this, I, don't, I don't think there's a rule book for this and, and you know, well, there isn't a rule book for this. So our approach has very much been around surveying our staff teams first, same way we surveyed our parents. And it's not just about some of the typical things such as um, how do you get to work? Did you travel on a bus? You know, some of the practical elements. It's how you're feeling. Um, mm. You know, what are your levels of anxiety? What is it that's making you anxious? Um, because there's a... You know, unfortunately, unfortunately, the, the fake, fake media, the social media, the PR, the things that people like to talk about out there that, that, that get around can play havoc with people's minds, and especially if they're in a, a delicate state anyway. So people who've been locked in a house, um, you know, you might have had the luxury of being in a slightly bigger house with lots of rooms and a garden and space. And we know that the, the opposite end of that is that people have been restricted within one room, no garden, you know, difficult family environment. It's not just children; it's the staff teams as well. You know, being a single parent um, uh, with with children that are cooped up in the house all day. You know, having vulnerable parents that where you haven't been able to go and see them. It's there's all manner of things out there that must be playing on our on our employees' minds. So what we have to do is try and understand what what those barriers are to help you know to help them come back, and then think about what it is we need to do to help them come back. What's the training we need to put in place? Um, we were talking about a hotline. Do we have a hotline for people when they're really feeling anxious? What skills do we need to give our managers? You know, uh, we all know that the job of being a nursery manager is one of being a teacher, a counsellor, an educator. It's, it's a huge range of skills and experiences that you need to pull on. And this is going to be tougher than ever when you're trying to manage the operation as well as the mental well-being of a lot of people that are coming back into your setting. So we've taken time to, to look at that and we're going to go through a process of, um, of understanding that with each of our settings with the managers um, and of course there's a lot of vulnerable people in that people who are pregnant um, uh, who you know we're going to talk to them about whether or not they come back so i think we're going to be finding this out as we go along in each of our individual settings um, and we're going to have to tackle them on a, on a, on a, um, a you know individual basis to understand the root of whatever the challenge is. Our yeah, parents then, uh, um, surveyed them as well. Sorry, Chris, you were going to ask a question on that. No, 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 Con carry on. Um, our parents we've surveyed, um, and again, we've gone out with some detail on, on the survey. Really interesting to get some of the initial surveys back, which was that 60% of our parents were looking to return back when we opened. Um, whatever that date may be, different in Scotland than England. 
and and of those 60 percent 80 percent of them wanted to come back on their existing booking patterns which we were quite baffled about to be uh, you know to start off with and the managers have come back and um you know there's a huge portion of those parents that just don't know and actually what we've tried to do is really help and, and have that dialogue with our teams on what are some of those questions some of the questions are how are you operating safely can you explain to me a little bit more about what my child's going to come back to and how you're going to operate who are the team members that they're going to come back to because it might not be the team member they came back they, they were with when when they left and actually as we've gone through those questions we've had some parents that have decided they were coming back and now said no actually i'm just not i'm just not comfortable with the science i've heard this from the local schools they're not opening up i'm not comfortable and um, all the way through to people saying okay that's great I'm, I'm, i wasn't going to but now i'm coming back so um we still got i think we still got two or three days with the phone calls to really try and understand we brought our managers back off bill on monday they've been going through training and education and then they're doing these um surveys and speaking to parents and we need to give them a little bit of time to digest this and then think as well so it's um i i do have a lot of empathy and sympathy for some of the managers who are trying at the moment to deal with a huge amount operationally to get in to get their minds around and um, whilst also trying to think about their own welfare and their staff's welfare it's it, it's there's no doubt it's tough and our job as, as leaders out there and, and as a business is think about how we do that in a way which helps them, structures that, structures that and supports them. Absolutely. So yeah, in a, in a, in a similar a similar vein and just continuing with the staff wellbeing um, sort of theme and, and, and challenge. And again, coming back to the, uh, the results of the survey that we ran, um, similar, similar really, about 60% weren't confident uh, of the respondents about managing the physical and mental well-being of, of staff um, on, on returning and uh, reopening uh, around the 1st of June. And Linda, I know you've done a, an awful lot of work on, on well-being and obviously, you know, in, in the, the, the uh, award, the Investors in People Platinum Award is a, is a, is a really great example of that. Um, question for you really, and it's on the same theme, is, you know, given the, the importance and how vital uh, the, the emotional and physical well-being of staff is uh, throughout the period, what approaches can nurseries take and what practical approaches can they take to maintain this in, in lockdown and in, in this transition towards reopening? I mean, what, what's really interesting, just drawing on a lot that Carrie was saying, I mean, even before the lockdown, we know that mental health and well-being was at one of the lowest levels within the sector before this. There were so many managers that were in burnout even before. And in, in some senses, a lot of the well-being initiatives were a little bit one-off hits and they hadn't really been embed, embedded fully into practice. And I think the positive here is that now we cannot have add-on well-being. Well-being has to be core and it has to be embedded into the fabric of organisations. And Carrie's right, one of the first things we have to start with is by asking questions and asking how people feel, not making assumptions because everybody's experience be at home or whatever has been very very different some people have thrived on lockdown they've become fitter they're eating well and on the flip side it's, it's had the opposite effect people have been in really bad relationships it's affected them badly so to me one of the biggest things now we have to really build is it's the health well-being but it's the resilience and emotional resilience of the staff now some people you'll say are they born with it or not some people have a natural level of some of the young staff that are emerging as incredible leaders that we didn't even know that that existed. And some of the senior members of staff that you're asking to lead are the ones with very low levels of resilience. So in a sense, we have to make sure and ask the questions to make sure that those that are leading others have uh, the, the capacity to be able to deal with everything that's happening now. Um, one of the things that we did recently with the group nurseries we we put together as a kind of a team it was in a well-being webinar and we put together kind of the top things that are making the difference in the nurseries so the things that managers can do to support us and i'll happily share that with everybody we kind of compiled it between us but if i had to pull out otherwise i'll talk forever i have to pull out one thing that makes the biggest difference it's communication and communicating well and that now, as we're all saying, is even more important now than 
ever before. And one thing we kind of called it was uh, in order to meet the three R's of our staff teams, one is, you know, reassuring, re-engaging and improving resilience. There are certain steps and we're talking about skills of leaders. High levels of emotional intelligence, being able to tune into people's feelings, which isn't difficult. Um, the number one thing is about being honest and open. And as you've just said, Carrie, the massive responsibility that managers are feeling, it can be overwhelming. It's, it's difficult to understand where to start. Um, they have to learn to delegate more. You have to start plucking out those emerging leaders and those with high resilience that in the very early stages are going to be your leaders and all support when it's appropriate leaders need to be and managers transparent about their own well-being and work and it was something you said the other day carrie you know parents are phoning into some of the nurses i'm talking to assuming that the manager of the nursery knows everything that's going to happen and can give them a very clear list of this is the way it's going to be and this is what's going to happen so they'll have all the answers well they don't have all the answers um, the other, the second one, and that's another one because I've spoken to quite a few leaders, is about being positive. <laughs> so positive leadership is going to be the most important because as humans, we're, we're wired naturally to a negative bias. So we'll always look for the things that aren't working well. And it was something that was happening way before COVID. And those are the things that within an organisation, like they tend to snowball. And that's where you're going to need the leaders because it derails people and it, it filters right through the organisation. And it's critical to, to for me, for, for leaders um, to practice and reinforce positivity so that you can control the things in a situation that you can manage. One of the number one ways of doing it, and I was working, it was actually in a hospital, because my background as a nurse, but I worked with a hospital team recently, and one of the things that they created was a workplace um, positive, positivity manifesto, which I wondered what it was at first, but when we went through it, it was brilliant to get the furloughed staff on for, involved and the staff in, um, in the, the Rodi nursery, so they can start to understand what means, what's meaningful to each of those groups. One of the first things they did was to list the 10 things that they can't do without. Now, whether you're at home or whether you're at work, and one of the number one things that came out was the virtual buddy system that they'd been able to set up. Uh, the other thing was everybody was doing a 10 minute yoga session and, and think mindfulness first thing in the morning. So they're the things to say, let's continue it, let's make sure that we share it. So we're talking about the things we can do for a lot of stuff. They haven't put as much makeup so they're saying we're saving a lot of money because i'm not actually wearing as much makeup and i realize i don't need it it's my new thing but it meant a lot the other thing is we're no longer going to have a six a six o'clock staff meeting where everybody fell asleep yippee it's about daily interactions with people and finding out how people are every hour every lunch time um and making sure those conversations are, are continued the other big one is is about one of the hardest things i think we're talking about here is seeing the future we can't we don't actually know what's going to happen next and one of the things i did with another team we, we uh, pulled together 10 things to look forward to post covid and that's about building optimism and hope and it helps people to see that there is some light at the end of the tunnel because it is difficult and it is hard but pulling together you know we will come out of it and one of the biggest things you want is that staff come out of this more resilient. Last thing I'm going to say is being supportive, um, looking after ourselves. And you know, how do you em empower, encourage people to take ownership of their well-being? And that was a huge question even before COVID. And one very simple little toolkit, which again happily to share with them, there's lots of things out there, is that individuals need to be able to assess and take control over their own well-being so you can find things that are they're out there now there's lots of resilience assessments there's lots of well-being assessments and one that we've done a very simple one again if anybody wants it you're very welcome to have it but it enables people to look at their own personal well-being create an action plan and those have been used for furloughed staff and staff in nurseries as a talking point but it's in a structured way so that individuals feel that they're taking control um of their own well-being um 
I think they're the main things that I'll go on forever. That, that's great, Linda. I think that you've touched on so many things there uh, that are really important, you know, from communication and, and in particular you know, around around leadership and its important uh, role in staff wellbeing. I think June may actually have joined us now. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if June can hear us. If you if you can say something and perhaps press the microphone button. I I don't know. Maybe not. I actually can't see who's, uh, whose cameras are working at the moment. I've just got a, a copy of a, a slide in front of me. So I will, I will just pick up on that, uh, that leadership question, um, if it's all right. And following on from, you know, how important it is for us all to be strong leaders through this time, you know, all members of staff are looking for, for guidance um, and, and we don't necessarily know all the answers. Um, but how, and, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll position this with David, if that's all right, but how important a role does company culture and core values play in helping to navigate the, the, the way through the, the, the current challenges? And have you, have you tried to maintain this through the lockdown period and, and, and how has it benefited Paint pay, pay, pay Pop? Um, well, absolutely. And I think I would agree completely with everything that Linda was saying and, and Carrie earlier, um, that it is about the leader setting the culture for the organisation. And that word hope is really important at this point. You know, if we go back and just say we're all doomed, you know, we'll just give up, won't we? We have to set a way for people to su succeed and for a way to get through this. And, and a huge element of that, to my mind, is about kindness and compassion. Uh, it's compassionate leadership, which is being um, emotionally literate. It is understanding where people are coming from and meeting their needs uh, aligned to the needs of the organization but you know it, it, that has to be where we where we start from communication yes that is absolutely key and all the way through this we've made sure that we've facilitated communication you know contacting people directly uh, emailing all of our teams um my wife Anna was sending out individually written cards to people who are at work this week just so that was posted through their letterbox and that is such a small thing in one sense but huge in terms of people's significance as an individual to receive something personal of that nature and I think all of those small things add up to a, a sense of caring a sense of we're in this together and it's um, that's how it's going to work I think the other thing about leadership is having confidence. You know, people are looking to us to set the way forward. And as Carrie says, we're not gonna get everything right. And we can be vulnerable, we can be honest with people, but we do need to be confident that we're leading the organization and the team with us. And I would go back to what I said earlier about trusting the science. You know, there's a lot of things that I see people doing and I'm not sure they're questioning why they're doing it. Why are we planning to remove sand from play areas? Is there science that proves that sand is, you know, a high risk? I'm not sure that anybody's researched that. Similarly, water play, you know, every soft toy is gone from our nursery. Every water play opportunity is banned. Every piece of sand. Well, is, is there a reason for that? And, and as leaders, are we reviewing and reflecting on that to ensure that that's in the best interests of everybody in, in the balance of it. And I think those are the very practical decisions that we need to be setting the tone for, for our team to say, this is what we're doing, this is why we're doing it. And as Carrie says, we might get that wrong, but at this stage, this is the best knowledge we have and the best understanding, and, and we're going to go with that. Hmm. Absolutely, and, and and Carrie, you know, just you know, this was a, a a question for everyone, really, in terms of the sort of the culture and the values. You know, how how important a part has that played for for you guys at, at Bertram? Yeah, I mean, one one of the um, uh, the kind of values that we hold is uh, children first, and and I think around all of these discussions, um, our head of early years, Ursula, has been great at putting the child right back at the centre and going, right, okay. So what's the impact on the child there? And, and that's formed some really great conversations. We do know that there will be, sadly, some, some elements where um, the experiences the child used to have, we might need to do it in a different way or they might not have them in the same way. But, you know, we have to, we have to really seriously think about it. If, if the, the reason that a lot of people are coming back into nurseries 
not just to help parents, but because there's a real worry about the um, the impact on children um, who are going to be staying at home and education. So we've got to put that first and say, what 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 are we doing and why are we doing it? And what's the impact on the child? And if the impact is positive, it's that risk versus benefit analysis, isn't it? And saying, you know, don't strip away everything. I saw some, some scary pictures yesterday of environments where um, they'd taken everything away and it just looked like a... Um, a, a, a hostel with a couple of tables uh, around and some you know solid wood materials that the children will play with it just felt soulless um yeah. and that's not going to um excite any children coming in it's it's certainly not going to excite the, the staff so i think we've got to be really really careful that we don't strip out what we're here to do um as david said earlier on and create soulless environments for children but we have to balance that with the risks that we all know around transmission and covid19 um, and I'll tell you the one thing that um, I, I think we've all done, and Chris, you and I said this a couple of times, it's, I've sat there with my head in my hands a number of times, and I haven't known the answers to it, and I've sat there, and I've had, I've had tough days, I've had down days, you know, sitting in the office, and I've found it tough, because sadly, what people do is you revert to kind of asking upwards, what's the answer, and you don't always have that answer. I've actually found that it's been better asking our managers and our teams that are out there and they've got the answers we don't necessarily have them so we do need to be really careful that we don't hold ourselves to provide all of the answers um, and get com comfortable with being humble in situations where you just do not know uh, and the one kind of phrase that i like to use is get comfortable with being uncomfortable because that's the environment we could be in for a period of time um, it's a uh, you know it, it, it's it yes it's the unknown um, but we remember what we're all here for, which is putting the children first um, and thinking about everything we do in our nursery has to surround that, um, you know, sec seconded by our staff team, of course. So, um, and I think, yeah, I think you're entirely right there. And it's been so difficult for, I think, everybody in a, in a similar position to, to you guys and myself included that to try and try and make such important and critical decisions when they're, the information's changing on a daily basis and, and, and the decision you made last week, you might not have made this week if you knew what was going on. So, and, and, and we, all that might... that week, were, we all remember that week when we were sitting waiting on the day by day bulletins from the government on what we're going to do next. You know, that was, that was horrible. That was absolutely horrible because you had parents saying, what are you doing about the fees, staffing? What are we doing about our salaries? And, you know, we're yeah. sitting there going, well, blimey, one day would have been a completely polar discussion to the next day around salaries you know and, and once we knew the furlough scheme was in place it was almost like a poof thank god for that so we're still going to have those days and we've just got to be, be mindful that you cannot plan for the unknown so don't try to absolutely and i think that touches on on linda's point from before about the, the importance of communication certainly as the, the landscape is changing rapidly we, we took the view to almost over communicate and even if there wasn't an update we give an update to say there wasn't an update just to make sure that people whilst they were distributed felt engaged and, and involved um, and, and just knew what was happening because everybody was in a, in a state of you know some sort of some sort of shock really um, and just just keeping on that that point of, of communication and this was you know this this was really a question for June and unfortunately I can't I can't pose it to it directly but if it's all right I'll, I'll, I'll um, Pick this up with you, Linda. And one of the conversations I've, I've been having prior to uh, to COVID with Jim was around the importance of pedagogical conversation between parents and practitioners. Um, and I, and I think that's you know, the question for for Jim was obviously that's a, a crucial part of child development. Why is it even more important in the current situation? And I, and I wondered if you had a, a view on that, Linda. I mean, it's about kind of the language that we use now and it's about i think a lot of it goes back to as Kara's saying about making sure that staff have the skills and knowledge and understanding um i think it's a lot to do with in, in order to establish pedagogical conversations it's about making sure that the key staff there are working with junior staff that really struggle to understand what it is they're seeing what it is they're doing and how to put it into practice um probably david i think will would pick up on it in a bit more detail because I don't want to take up too much of your time from a no problem and David is, is you know do, um, in terms of you know the, the, the parent and practitioner communication you know why why do you feel that is you know so important um, post lockdown 
Well, it, interestingly, I did a, um, an online training session last Saturday, I think it was, um, talking about back to basics with the role of the adult and just reminding us of the uh, principles of the EYFS. And the two that I've highlighted were the unique child. And Carrie yeah. said, let's put the child yeah. at the centre of what we're doing. And secondly, positive relationships and the role of the adult in, um, you know, establishing those relationships and having good interactions and communication that includes the families is vital in that. And I think if we focus on those as our two main priorities coming back, we're not going to go far wrong in terms of pedagogy because all child development rests on those elements, really. So I, I think June is June back with us. I'm not sure. Hello, I'm here. Hi, June. Oh, I'm here. Yeah. I can hear you guys. Brilliant. Fantastic. Uh, I'm sorry, sorry about this ridiculous uh, c communication failure on my part. <laughs> right. No problem. It's lovely to have you here, June. Uh, I really appreciate it. I'm sure all the uh, the attendees do too. Um, and 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 quite coincidentally, we were on your question, so uh, it'd be great if I could. Yes, I, I, I was. I was listening. I was listening to. I was listening to you guys on it. I wouldn't disagree with anything that uh, Linda or um, David have just said about uh, caliber of staff and confidence. And I was listening to the business of leadership through hope. And I think um, I'm just actually writing a piece at the moment called the COVID pedagogy, because I think we need to agree. And I think it might have been Carrie who said, you know, there's lots of fact and fiction out there about why can't we have sand? Why can't we have water? Well, we have all of those things. And if you look at the statistics, uh, I think 62% of us uh, stayed open at some, at some level during the last two months. And no child has been harmed as a consequence. And I think we need to understand that and, and recognize that that is uh, the, the starting point. Um, and so hygiene is important, but so is transition. And I'm hearing all sorts of scary stuff about children not being able to have a hug, uh, no transition toys, uh, no sand, no water. Why wouldn't you have water? I mean, washing your hands is what they spend their entire day doing. So why would you take water away? Um, we know COVID is killed by cooking. So why don't we have cooking? You know, but I think what we need to do is understand what this looks like and give, give some actually some rules and also pay attention to routine. I think routine needs to be almost militaristic now because so many children are going to come with so many different um, uh, home experiences so that I think we need to have same songs, same order, same routine. We need to go back to the days of, you know, accommodation and assimilation of ideas so that there's a lot of repetition, a lot of reassurance. And then we are bound in this crazy world of ours um, with all this talk of mindfulness and uh, anxiety and uh, fear and health and well-being, which are all is true. I understand all of that. But if that's the only thing you're hearing and you're on furlough, your confidence is actually damaged by that, not increased, because if you're not hearing words like resilience, capability, children's adaptability, flexibility, and they're all the things we need to really draw out in the way we present, the way we teach and the way children learn right now, rather than fixating on what can be actually quite negative. Absolutely. Um, and uh, so what we, we actually opened up, June, um, and you know, apologies, apologies that you missed that, but we opened up by just asking everyone what their, their experiences had been since lockdown, you know, what was the impact on, on the, the nurseries and nursery groups and, and what, do you, what did you think that the biggest challenges would be uh, moving back to some form of normality? And I think it'd be great just to get your views, your views on that and the perspective um, with your own nurseries and in particular being in, a, in an inner city environment as well. So how, how was it for you? My biggest anxiety and the thing that keeps me awake at night is tr public transport. Um, and while I had um, smaller teams in uh, 15 nursery hubs across London, I used to pay for cabs for them to travel to avoid the tube. So where the trains were empty and the buses were empty and they could walk our cycle, that wasn't a problem. I did not like them going on the crowded tubes. And I've also asked that they wear masks. And I know the mask is more to protect other people, but I feel it's just something that gives people some sense of security. So we're currently making some attractive, lovely masks as opposed to those blue and white things that you get. 
Um, and uh, so that's the first thing I think for me is the anxiety about um, travel in. Once you're in, I was talking to my managers about this this morning, and they said, well, we've created a cocoon you. You know, when you were in the nursery, everybody feels safe. It's all cocooned, it's all lovely and cozy. It's kind of like a safe cave away from the horrors out, outside. But as you get more and more staff in, that's gonna be problematic because people will be used to having their lunch and having a break. And if we're all in bubbles of 16 or uh, whatever, um, the space is going to be somewhat limited. So I think we're gonna to have to think carefully about how do we give people a break from, um, from the day's uh, activities and how do we do that safely? Um, and then we've had a whole conversation about COVID pedagogy and what we're going to have and what we're not going to have. And what extra training I'm going to put on to support staff. So for example, we're using music and drama a lot at the moment. It's low on resources and it's creative. And the children who've currently been in our nurseries, and I think that you guys might have also seen this, is the caliber of teaching, because some of my best teachers are in, is fantastic. The capability to allow children to follow their interests has been amazing. And the level of conversation and extension of language and you know all the serve and return stuff has been powerful, powerful. So some of those children are going to feel a little bit put out when the new children arrive and we go back to a kind of order. But on the other hand, I think this, that's what's going to be really essential for the staff as well. A sense of you come in, you take the child, you wash your hands, you change your shoes, you know, you move through the day in that kind of cadence. I think that that's going to be really important. Um, and if you want to play with cardboard boxes, you know, you store them for the 24 hours, you spray them with the Dettol and then they're ready for action. Uh, I think we're blessed at the moment with good weather, so lots of outside play can be uh, good, and we know that COVID isn't so contagious outside. So I think I think we need a rationale and a clarity around that, and we need to cut through all the, if I if I'm allowed to say it, but basically all the crap that's kind of getting that's out there and where people are publicly scaremongering or finger pointing. I think I said that in the blog last week, but it it isn't helpful. It isn't helpful because People like me and David and uh, Karim are, you know, we're taking a, a leadership leap here into a bit of a darkness because somebody has to start the journey. And if we don't do it, nobody will follow. And I think that's what's important. And people can say, well, you're putting people at risk. People are putting themselves at risk. We didn't ask, you know, thousands of people to go onto South End Beach and sit on top of each other. You know, when you go to the parks, you see lots of people. So I think there's something around how do you navigate that through with the best of intentions and the journey at the end is that your nurseries are delivering proper pedagogy not a half-baked kind of scaredy cat approach but a well-informed thing and i think there's another part of this june which is we don't always agree and that's actually really healthy that we don't always agree on what we need to do because it means that some people will try things and others won't and then we might find a new way of managing something um, you know, not everybody's going to feel comfortable uh, about doing some of the stuff that you're doing, but at least you can do it and then say, it's okay, we've done it and it's been okay. And then, and you know, views might change, uh, but we, we do have to be prepared to listen, listen to the evidence and listen to our peers and, and take some risks. Otherwise, you know, it's going to be a very Precisely. difficult, difficult 12 months ahead, 18 months, however long this lasts. Yeah, that, that is the thing Sorry, yeah, I mean, the, um... I'm sorry. Oh, right, go on. Was that Linda? Linda, did you want to, to add something I'll, there? I'm just going to jump in and just echo some of the things that June was saying there, you know, because we live in this, we're seeing this from a different perspective. And in, in, in many ways, our values are beginning to change, but I think for the better. And I think we're beginning to recognise more and more what's really important to us, we're talking about it now, and what isn't. And I think my biggest hope for, for leaders now is that we'll learn lessons from this and, and some of the skills, because I do seriously believe that resilience is key and important, but we have to become more mentally agile and adaptable. And that's going yeah, to be between now and the next few years, because one of the biggest, biggest things here, a lot of people will actually forget some of the things that we've gone through now, but the biggest thing they will not forget is how their leaders and managers and organizations made them feel. Absolutely. And that will not, I agree. That will not, not, not go away. And we'll come back to the same old issues later on of recruitment and retaining people. So we've got, we've got almost a chance 
to readdress the balance in a lot of ways and do the things that, in a sense, some people are doing, but everyone should be doing that should be foundational to everything that we do. Right, sorry, that was me dipping. <laughs> I couldn't agree more, Linda. Um, Wise words, Linda. Should... Wise words. <laughs> Occasionally. Um, <laughs> Um, I'm just just slightly conscious of time, um, and we've uh, we've got just a little bit more time now to um, to ask some questions that have come in from from the attendees. Um, given June that you've just uh, you've just arrived and sort of playing catch up a little bit. Sorry. I thought, oh, 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 no, 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 it's fine. I'm I'm so so delighted that you're here. Um, but the I thought I'd pose the first one to you. Um, so this is from Stacey in Essex, uh, and it's what's, what further support do you feel the early years sector needs from the government to make the reopening of nurseries successful, not just in the short term, but for the long term too? Oh, still there? Hello? Is June still there? She's, is she's still there and the microphone's on, but... Um... I'm struggling to hear you, June. I heard the last bit. I have to. I, I have to keep walking around the house to keep getting it from breaking up. So I'm. I'm now in the. I'm now in the bathroom, guys. Uh, so it's a whole echo thing. Going. I hope you haven't got a camera on as well. I'm sitting on the edge of the bath. Would you believe? Holding my phone over my head. Honest to God. <laughs> Um, so I'll, I'll start again. It was it was a question from Stacey in in Essex, um, and it was in relation to what further support do you feel the earlier sector needs from the government to make the reopening of nurseries successful, not not just in the short term but in the long term too. Well, I think that's a funding question, Stacey, and it's a status question. So I think we have to now prove that we were what I call the fourth emergency service, and that actually to run the country you actually need decent childcare because parents work. And that's been one of the factors. And the second thing is, if they're going to believe that, and if this is, if we're going to have more than one pandemic and we're going to need to have na you know, quite quick responses and, and national responses to national crisis, I think then they need to understand our role in that. And then we definitely need to be funded correctly. Um, you know, we need to be funded correctly anyway, but we seriously need to be funded now. We've, I mean, the government hasn't, been, you know, we had to fact battle a lot with the government to even give us any credit and even mention us in the conversation. You know, the conversation was all about schools and it wasn't, we weren't actually mentioned for a long time. So we really kicked off about it and we were really going on about it. And now, certainly now they've mentioned it. So I think we need to capitalize on that. I think um, our, 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 our problem, I, can be uh, the difference in us, and we're all in a, in a way differently shaped. But our strength can also be in our, our difference and our ability to come together, which we did reasonably quickly, actually, as a, an as a group of different organizations having one voice. If we can hold that, if we can hold that, and we can hold the government to account against that. And that's, you know, that's including the very supportive voice we had from people like Neil Leach at the Early Years Alliance, and the NDNA, um, uh, you know, if we can hold that, but it's not about necessarily membership, it's about pedagogy, it's about the purpose, it's about us all pulling together to deliver a service that's essential, an infrastructure uh, service that's essential, and therefore it should be funded accordingly. Then I think we have a future. Absolutely. Um, thanks, you. I really appreciate the, the views there. Um, I've got another question that's come in from Jenny in London, and this one's around staffing. So I thought I'd pose this one to Linda again, if that's all right. Um, and it's, do you think we'll be facing a staffing crisis more than ever in June uh, with employees not wanting to come into work and risk compromising their own family safety? Mm, I think without a doubt that is an issue. And I've heard that. I mean, even some of the students that we've been working with at the moment that some of, again, have embraced where they are now, they've taken up learning, they're gearing themselves up to coming back. Others have had completely different experiences at home and have actually lost their passion and direction um, and are worried for lots of different reasons coming back. But I think that all goes back to communication. And I think we we're talking about as David, we have to, have to uh, bring a level of hope. And I think June kind of said it there, we cannot go into this blame culture and looking at all of the things that have gone wrong, all of the people that have caused this, 
And I think the more that we pull the sector together at the higher level, organisational level, and within each individual nursery, it is about regaining that passion. I think it will be an issue, but I think we've got a chance now, again, as June's saying, working with lots of the organisations out there of, of coming together and working together more so that people feel more, um, uh, their sense of belonging in, in the sector. So they feel they're actually making a difference. And I think we're going to really, they're going to, people will realise that they do actually need it, but it's the communication that's key. Absolutely. Um, and then there's just one final question. Um, so, uh, David, if, if, if it's all right, I propose this one to you. And this was in relation to, to homeschooling, um, whilst there's, there's been separation between the nurseries and the parents. Um, and it's the homeschooling has become a, a key responsibility for parents during the lockdown. How important do you think that this extended learning still take place uh, when a, a child leaves the nursery setting? So, um, that was James in Basingstoke, sorry. Okay. Uh, we've always, um, I mean, we use tapestry for connecting with home, and we've always encouraged and invited parents to participate in their children's learning. And again, I would say that is very much a relational aspect of what we do, establishing that link between parents and, and a partnership in learning. And anything that they've done at home that benefits their child, we would encourage to, you know, we would validate that, acknowledge that and celebrate that together. And, and that's what we do anyway. So, yes, you know, any strengths that we've got from that, I mean, it, it's interesting, isn't it? Parents seem to have either one view or another of uh, their experience of having their children. It's been wonderful and we've all learned together, you know, please take my child back as quickly as possible. We can't do this a day longer. So somewhere in between the two of those, you know, we've won admiration for that. We've had a couple of comments from parents saying, I now appreciate just exactly what you do. And that was sort of three days in. So goodness knows what it's like after eight or nine weeks but you know it, it's it's been an interesting time from that perspective hasn't it that uh, parents have had that opportunity for intensive um, yeah. relationship building with their children and as we've said that may have been a good positive experience equally they might have found that quite challenging um, but that's humanity and and you know we we do that together and we always have done absolutely Okay, so so I think that that's that's about it. I think one of the um, one of the points that Linda made earlier on was about the sector coming together um, and you know trying to come to some come together as one, and that that's one of the the very positive things that's that's happened as a result of this. And that, I think a good example of that is the um, and I referenced it earlier on. I think with some of the uh, surveys that have been carried out, there's a COVID nineteen response group uh, that I think a number of uh, number of the panelists sit on. Um, and I know that they pulled together an awful lot of uh, awful lot of work collaboratively uh, to try and help the sector with things like standard operating procedures. Um, so I just wanted to draw uh, the audience's attention uh, to that work. And it might just help to shine a bit of light on things like the risk assessments and, and the standard operating procedures um, for nurseries as they, they progress back to reopening. Um, so we, we've uh, uploaded these into our, into our blog. I've also, also spoken to to the guys at the COVID response group to make sure that they're, they're fine with us doing that. Um, so the links here, and it would obviously be um, uh, circulated within the recording of this webinar as well. And in terms of other great resources, Jim obviously needs very little introduction, but um, she's, a, she's an avid blogger um, and uh, she's written a fantastic blog just recently. I think it was put on the website on the 18th, I think, June, um, which was a, another, yeah. another yeah. man candidate to the COVID-19 unknown. So I think um, if anybody is looking for for some resources and some some additional guidance in addition to uh, the insights that the the panel's given today, um, then you know the, the June's blog and and the uh, the resources from the COVID response team are are uh, very worthwhile. So I'm absolutely delighted that uh, we all managed to come together as a panel eventually after a couple of times of trying. So thanks so much for for jiggling things around for us. Um, and for, you know, following the reschedule from yesterday, I'm glad to say we didn't break the software again this time. So uh, we did we did go live. Um, thanks very much for, for the audience for, for joining us today. Uh, there will be a recording of the session, um, and it will um, uh, it will be circulated uh, following the following the webinar. Um, but if you could just take a little bit of time just to complete the survey, 
um, that will pop up as we as we close out on the webinar. That'd be really good, just so that we know how we how we did um, and and what you want to see next. So, thanks very much to everyone. I uh, really appreciate your time and um, hope you all stay safe and see you next time. Bye. 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 Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Take care. You too. Done. Whew. I was getting